Welcome back to the Gehen Story Studio. I'm Chris, and today I'll be telling you about a wall sign I made last year. It was a commission for Voltalius Porto office. Since they are a renewable energy company, the idea was to build a piece with old wood and logs that the employees would bring. It was a surprise project for the team, so they didn't really know what the wood was being used for. The employees brought logs, old pine planks, and pallo wood. I carried it all to my studio and cut it into strips to create a large 2-meter panel. There was a piece of wood that smelled a bit weird once I cut it open, but I still slice it into small boards anyway. I'm guessing you're guessing what that smell means, but let's continue for now. Most of the logs were eucalyptus, which is pretty hard. Thankfully, I had a brand new bandsaw blade that went through it nicely enough. I moved into prepping these old pine planks. The point here is to make the wood as stable as possible. I started by removing the pith, which is easily spotted by the cracking along the grain. This is the tree center, as seen from the small diameter rings here. It must be discarded since the plank will always try to cup in this area. Some of these boards looked really disgusting and had some old bug damage, so I had to get rid of that outer layer. They also brought some outer cutoffs from ash logs that I tried to salvage since ash is a pretty stable wood. It was also the widest I had, making a cool color transition in the final panel. I removed some of the bark to prevent hurting the bandsaw blade too much. The bark is typically hard and comes with dirt and debris that can quickly dull blades. I freehanded that first line and then pulled the fence back to cut a couple of strips from it. All the wood is cut into 25mm or 1 inch thick pieces and left to dry further for a few days. I then picked up my new moisture meter and programmed it to each wood species to see their moisture content. The eucalyptus was around the 21 to 25 value at this point and I was shooting for numbers close to 11 because that was my studio's equilibrium moisture content value during those weeks. So I laid the pieces a few centimeters apart and air conditioned the room to meet 24 degrees Celsius for a week. A week later I rechecked the moisture content on the eucalyptus pieces and thankfully it was down to a 17 or 18 mark. By the end of the project, it was down to 13, which was a pretty good value for Porto. Unfortunately, the other wood, which smelled weird and resembled green olive wood, was still very wet. It was unusable for this project. The moisture content was over 32, which is the max reading from the moisture meter. I discarded these pieces and focused on joining two faces on the rest of the wood. I didn't show the pine or ash pieces because they all showed a workable moisture content and were ready to go. Once I had two adjacent faces joined for all the eucalyptus, I moved into joining the ash. Some people from the company brought these small bits of wood that I didn't want to leave out. Instead of using the planer, I went right into the timble saw and cut everything into strips. <laughs> 
Eventually, the dust collector's red light started blinking, so I had to empty the bucket. It was rainy and dark, so I didn't film that. With a fresh new bag, I could resume cutting all the wooden strips, which took several hours. To make the fourth face square and smooth, I turned all the strips 90 degrees and removed the bands on marks. The next day, I trimmed the ends of all pieces with no particular length. It took me a couple of hours to organize all the wood by color. I prefer doing a color gradient and keeping the species next to each other rather than mixing them all up. It just made more sense in my brain regarding the long-term stability of the panel. I needed the panel to be at least 2 meters long and 66 centimeters wide. It took a while to get to the point where I was satisfied with the gradient. I noticed that some pine knots were too noticeable and could disturb the piece's overall look. They would be especially evident once finished, so I removed those at the table saw. To trace a straight line, I used the chalk line tool. It's pretty rare for me to use this tool, but it comes in handy when I need it. At this point, the work tables were full of wood strips, so I placed an extra worktop over one side of the panel to start gluing up the pieces. I transposed the pieces maintaining their layout over the silicone mat. I applied packing tape to the coals to keep the glue from sticking. I didn't glue the entire panel at once. I divided it into three main parts and each of them was glued in two halves. In total, I had six small panels. Not only could I prevent the glue from drying before the clamping was ready, but I could also keep each part relatively flat. Another reason was to be able to fit the parts in my drum sander and get the surface perfectly leveled.
Once the glue was set, I could remove the clamps and scrape off most of the squeeze out. Before running them through the drum sander, I cut the excess bits from each end that were getting in the way. It took a while to run all these through the drum sander. They did run a bit slow to the hardness of the wood and the fact that the entire width of the roller was being used. What really matters is that in the end I got extremely flat boards with no effort. With everything flat, I could trim each part to their final width at the table saw. One of the parts had a slightly covered edge, so I had to get creative and make two stable points of contact with the fence using a thick tape. It worked really well and I could then turn the panel around and make a parallel straight cut. As I said before, each of the three main parts is made of two halves. Now it's time to glue them. I didn't apply too much pressure with the clamps to prevent it from bowing. I used the track saw to trim the ends as these panels wouldn't fit my crosscut sled. The track did move slightly during the cut, because of that I repeated the cut with the track secured with these specialty clamps. The second end could easily be cut with a table saw. The panels are finally ready to be CNC. I ran the code on my Avid CNC machine. I'm always amazed at its precision. I drew everything on Vcarve Pro, including the actual size of each panel, to ensure the letters position could come out exactly where I wanted them in the material. The software has an Avid CNC post processor built in, making it super easy to export the G code to run the machine. I 
probably didn't need tabs for this job, but I still added them to ensure the interior of the letters wouldn't move around and make the bit crash against them. Better be safe than sorry. I cleaned those with a chisel and a cute little new mallet from Cat's Moses. I repeated the process for the other two panels. The computer control machine had done a great job. I always get nervous, especially on a project where I spend so many days making just the wood panels. The underside of the middle panel had lots of holes from large pallet nails and although these won't be seen in the final project, this is for a client. I didn't feel comfortable delivering it the way it was. So I decided to fill those with thin dowels. For other imperfections I used CA glue to make the surface smooth. One of the interior sides had wormholes that I filled with 5 minute epoxy. All these repairs were thankfully on the back side. The eucalyptus had quite some cracks, but I wasn't too worried about them. They were already there the first day I cut the logs. They also seemed stable enough as I didn't notice any further cracking throughout the weeks I spent working on this project. And here I found a moment to put my beautiful trimming plane to use. Now it's time to refine all surfaces from the interior edges of the letters to power sanding the main faces. The end grain took some time to sand smooth with all the CA and epoxy glue filling the cracks. I added a small chamfer around the exterior edges using a palm router. I applied the finish before moving to other parts of the build so that it could cure for at least one week before the final installation. I used the hard wax oil to give the whole panel a matte and slightly amber look. It takes some time to spread evenly and remove the excess, but I only had to do it once since this is a single coat product. I've been using this finish a lot in my projects and although it is not perfect, it is easy to apply, which removes some stress from my shoulders.
This wall sign will work like a giant light box with letters illuminated by a colorful LED strip. To make the frame, I cut birch plywood into 8 cm strips to make three rectangles, one for each section. I boot jointed them together with screws, so I pre-drilled and countersunk the outer pieces using my recently built drill press table. I have a video on how I made these awesome drill press table, fans, clamps and other upgrades. I recommend you take a look and get inspired to build something similar for your shop. I will leave the link below. As I was waiting for the LED strip to arrive before laying out all the whole placement, I took a break from the frames and started working on the three-dimensional element of the logo. The logo has an iconic letter O, made out of four turbine blade shapes resembling water drops, probably because Voltali is a renewable energy company. As it is the logo's most colorful part, I wanted that icon to pop. I started by sticking the templates over some light colored pine. Light colored wood will have more vibrant colors when dyed than dark toned wood. I cut the drops on the bandsaw and finished shaping the exterior curves on the belt sander. For the interior curvatures, I use the sanding drum on the drill press since I don't have a spindle sander. To break the crispier shape of the letters and create a contrasting look, I decided to make a large round over around the front contour of the drops. To dye the wood and get the most vibrant colors, I used Ecoline inks, which are typically used by artists for watercolor painting and illustration work. I used this a lot back in art school and I know wood fibers absorb these nicely. You just need to be careful and spread the ink quickly for a clean even look to prevent brush streaks. If you let the ink dry and brush more ink on top, you'll get darker marks where the ink is double layered. I had to mix some of the colors to match Voltalia's original logo best. Looking good, I will let this dry entirely for a few hours and in the meantime I'll start working on the lighting. I wanted to give the client a very sophisticated color experience. 
To accomplish that, instead of basic RGB lights, I went with one of these new RGB IC LED strips. Besides playing the basic fixed colors, it can do hundreds of color shades, animations and color progressions that are entirely customizable via the app. I never liked the RGB fad, but man, these new generation LED strips are super cool. I was running out of time. Thankfully, my dad is always ready to help in his free time, so I called him and asked for help with the LED strip soldering. Because the sign is divided into three, I needed a solution for a quick professional looking connection. I went with four pin GX12 connectors that are made of metal and can be securely attached to the box framing. When the LED segments are connected, I will still have a continuous strip and color scheme, which is crucial to get the most out of these LEDs. With the connection and lighting figured out, I could resume drilling all the holes in the plywood frames. I made a large recess with a forstner bit to embed one half of the connector and allow some room to twist the locks of the other half. I decided to go with the French cleat system to hang the panels on the wall. I wanted it to be completely hidden and have a single wood plank on the wall to hang the three parts. This meant I had to create relief cuts in the middle sides of the frame. You will allow the boxes to slide left and right freely for perfect positioning in the wall. All cuts and holes are done so I can permanently glue and screw the frames together. I painted the frames with dark grey acrylic paint to create some contrast. I attach the 45 degree cleats with pocket holes to the top back of the frames. This is how it is going to work when up in the wall. I added aluminum LED profiles upside down to ensure the LED's heat could dissipate. Being client work and knowing the sign will be turned on daily, I wanted to avoid sticking the LED strip directly to the plywood. I could install the GX12 connectors, finalize any soldering, and securely attach the power supply to the outside of the frame, where it's ventilated, but still hidden. You can only see it if you peek from below. These profiles also allow for a clean layout of the cables inside the boxes, so everything looks tidy. With all the frame and lighting complete, I could work on the final assembly, which includes some frosted acrylic to enclose the letters. 
I cut the shapes adapted to each letter or pair of letters on my new laser cutter. It is pretty awesome and I'll share more about it in the future videos. A couple of them need to get past the frame line since the letters are very close to the edges of the panels. This will allow the light to spread evenly throughout each letter. I chiseled the pocket on the plywood frame to allow the acrylic to sit correctly. It was finally time to attach the panels to the frames, and for that I used expansion brackets. They have these elongated holes to allow for wood movement throughout the seasons. I also made some elongated holes in the acrylic, so the wood can expand and contract freely. Otherwise it might crack while stuck to a piece of acrylic that doesn't move as much over the seasons. The sections will be connected this way and I left about 12 centimeters of extra white cable in the movable half of the connector. It allows the parts to be joined before the panels are slid together on the wall and that bit of cable retracted into the frame. Here I tested the light effect by placing a backing material mimicking the wall. It's time for the final touches like taping and screwing the colorful drops in place and adding metal latches to the middle joints. At the event everyone enjoyed the new wall sign and I was delighted to see all the smiling faces. Big thanks to Voltalia for the challenge they presented me. It was a fun project that got me away from the typical functional furniture I've been doing in recent years. I hope you enjoyed the process and learned something from this video. Now it's time to get your hands dirty. Até já.